Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. It's uh, bad weather. I'm really pleased that this is such a wonderful turnout. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff He, He Hua Ping, and uh, I'm the current president of uh, ACA, Alliance of uh, Chinese American San Diego. And uh, our organization is a non-political, non-profit organization. And uh, we, our chief mission is to serve uh, immigrant community through education, empowering, and uh, engagement of the newcomers. That's our chief mission. Um, tonight's talk is, uh, is uh, one of our education series. And uh, we, we like to uh, talk about the, the Chinese history, Chinese American history, the history of San Diego. To, to talk about San Diego history, I think uh, you won't find any, anybody who's better than Tom, my, my good friend, uh, for tonight's talk. And uh, tonight, I am very honored to have this opportunity to introduce to all of you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. For a while, I didn't know for sure you were talking about somebody else. <laughs> you know, when I came, Jeff said, you know, the library here closes a certain hour, and so we need the time to talk. And I'm reminded of the after-dinner speaker who got up to talk. And he got up to talk, he kept talking, people in the rear started to leave, he still kept talking. And until everybody left, except one sitting about, where Emma is sitting right over there. The speaker leaned over and said, ma'am, I'm sure glad you stayed. And she said, sir, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> so it's time to... I appreciate this opportunity. But anyway, this is a book, Rabbit on Puppy Road. I think most of you know Chinese calendar has 12 animals. And I was born in the year of the rabbit. And this is my mother. My mother came from China. And that's me at three years old. And I have a, the animal of my birthday is right down the bottom of the rabbit. Okay. Let's move along on this. In 1884, I decided to write a book because my 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 late wife, my late wife uh, Dorothy from Hawaii, um, had a diary when I married, and I was 25 then. She was 19, and uh, she used to write a diary. She said, "Tom, you ought to write a diary." I said, "Oh, I don't want to write a diary." He said, "No, you must write a diary because one day." People might want to read about it. So it took me about three years to finally be convinced to write a diary. So when I wrote my book, I have 50, 60 years of diaries to, to, to work from. So that's, you'll find it in the book. This is my grandfather, came 1884. And so, uh, 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 Hum Fung, and he was a friend of, uh, of uh, many of the old, uh, um, pioneers of Chinatown that came in China at that time. But in 1884, I just want to share with you, in 1882, uh, Congress of the United States passed a law, that's what you call Exclusion Act of the Chinese, Chinese Exclusion Act. That was the first and only law since the history of San Diego 
they ever pass a law excluding a race of people. And that, that law was to last 10 years. After 10 years came up, they renewed it. Then that 10 years came up, they renewed it again. And they renewed it again for 60 years until, until 1943, when China was an ally with the United States fighting the World War in the China against Japan. So they, they, they passed on that law. So since then, the immigration of Chinese have been uh, coming more regularly. But before that time, there were only two types of people of Chinese descent can come to America. Those who had a business interest here and those who might be students. So my dad came at the age of 15. So why don't we change this here? My dad here, he's about 30 there, and he had 12 children at the end. One of the things my dad had with the 12 children, he, I, I can say he was my first mentor in life, 12 children, and they were aged from you know, a baby, a boy, a small boy, until uh, about 16, and uh, he would say, all right, there are 12 of you, I want your older ones always take care of the younger ones, the young one to, to help the older ones take care of the, the, the family structure. And one of the ways he taught us with 12 children, that when he came home from work, he owned a produce company, he had a watermelon with him. He would cut it up in many pieces, large and small. And you know who picked first? Yes. My youngest yes. brother, Paul. He would stride her up to the table and pick the youngest one. Then the next youngest one picked the next smallest one. The last one left with my brother, Jim. And Jim had the big ones, but he picked last. That was his responsibility. So as we go on the story here, you will see that structure has, has uh, structured our family ever since. Okay, this is my father. And my father, my mother died um, with my father's first wife. Uh, then, not that he had two wives, but, um, but after she passed away, there were five boys. That's me, fourth one on the right. So my dad was alone uh, with the help from my aunt and so forth. He decided to marry again, went back to China and found a wife. And you know how, how, how they got married then is that he didn't go to seek the girl that he wanted, but rather his father's, his, his father uh, and, the, and the wife went to a grocery store with and my father and another friend from another village with their daughter went to a grocery store. And why they shop? And they wanted the young people to eye each other. And so my dad approved the situation and married my second mother to America. So why don't we switch to the next one here. And this is my second mother here. Well educated, that was a period of Sin Yat Sin, the great movement in China, well read, and so well read when he came here, many of the families came to see her to correspond back home for them in Chinese writing. So she was a good philosopher. Uh, so as a young person, I heard so many Chinese opera music in the house. And so she was uh, well-grounded in the culture of China. So she came with an understanding that there are five boys that she can also have a family too. <laughs> and so let's move on here. And indeed she had, she had seven children. But that pecking order that my dad structured for us with 12 children, and uh, so it's continually uh, live on. That's, the first girl, as uh, my younger sister, Helen, and although there's a division to her mother, we're very close, and uh, we, she was she would refer to as my mother. And so we worked together, and when my father died later, that really fell into place. Okay, let's move on. My dad, he was a food peddler when he came to America. And uh, eventually he built his business up. And when he came off the boat in San Francisco, one of the places 
he was invited to was to go to the Presbyterian Mission in Chinatown, San Francisco. And there, when she, he went to the mission there, they, they gave him a Bible story. The Bible story with David, David and Goliath. He was so impressed with the story of David Goliath. In America, he decided to adopt his name, American name, is David. So it's David Hom. Um, so that's how you see David Poo's company. David Poo's company was a rather large company at the time, but it's not large from comparison to the big ones. So I, I can tell you a story about that later on. So anyway, that's me at age 15. I was delivering that, and it so happened that... Uh, Which one was you in the picture? Yeah, oh, that's me. That's oh, me oh. on the left or on the bottom. That's me on the left. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the produce market was uh, right down towards a gas lamp area. And the gas lamp area is something like the fish market, you know. In the early time, you work early in the morning, and uh, all the work is done later in the afternoon. And the hours are long, and uh, it's a group of different racial groups, Japanese, Chinese, and uh, Mexican, uh, Italians, Irish, and so forth. It was a conglomerate uh, society there. And we all got along very well. So, okay, let's move on here. And uh, my, my father died in 1943, the height of World War II. And I, I, I and my brother, we had to support the family. I had to drop out of high school. I was 16 years old then, and he died when he was 47 in 1943. So my brother, Jim, uh, Alan, and I supported the family. And you see me here in Bathrow. This is uh, near Mission Hills overlooking Mission Valley. Mission Valley didn't have shopping centers or anything. The freeway just went in, some, some, of, some of it there. And because the long hours that I was working for about two years, three years perhaps, and uh, I, I, when I was delivering produce downtown, I saw a big trailer that said, free x-ray. So I said to myself, free x-ray? I think I'll take a free x-ray, anything free. <laughs> so I took a free x-ray, they called me back later to a, a month, they say, Mr. Hunt, we have to take another x-ray to be sure. So I took that another x-ray and they called me back in about a week. He said, Mr. Hum, I'm sorry to tell you this. You have an early case of tuberculosis. I don't know. And that was in 1950. They had no care for tuberculosis at that time. My father died from TB. So they so say, we have to put you in a sanitarium. So they put me in a sanitarium and there's where I am, at a sanitarium. I don't look sick because it was still early in the stage. And so it was a real nice place in a big dormitory for about, and there were several uh, dormitory with women uh, separate from men, and then the, the men, uh, each dormitory had about 25. And so one of the first thing, uh, when I walked into that dormitory and, uh, when they said they scared after I, I was uh, putting PJs and everything, going to the bed, some of the people would yell out, hey, hum, welcome, hum. Just remember, you can either walk out or get carried out. <laughs> That's the theme then. You know, not too many people can walk out. And say, just remember, so you can either walk out or get carried out. So that told me I should really take care of myself. You had to be bedridden and all that. And so I was bedridden for a whole month, bare bed, bed pans and everything. It took me several, it seemed like a couple of hours to be able to use a bed pan. You know, you're not used to it. And so anyways, I was there. And so anyway, I, I learned a lot about people there. And, uh, uh, I, I eventually, they, went with, they, they had a, um, a professional barber come in, I remember. He'd come in every week and cut hair. 
eventually he moved out of town and uh, and so they needed a barber. They couldn't find a barber to come in a TV hospital to cut hair. Well, it just so happened with uh, nine, nine boys in our family, my dad chose me to be the barber. <laughs> so I cut the hair of my brothers. So I knew how to cut hair. I knew the crew cuts and, and different things. So I told them I could cut hair. So anyway, I started cutting hair and everybody liked it. <laughs> the, the old barber charged 75 cents, I charged 50 cents if you had it. I said, 50 cents if you had it. Most of them didn't have it. So, so anyway, I cut hair there. Then after that, when my strength started coming back and so forth, and um, taking a treatment called pneumoperitoneum, a scientific name is that they, they inject air in your diaphragm right above your stomach. And you pump air in there and they collapse your lungs to one fourth capacity. And then you can breathe very slowly and very carefully. And that way it rests your lungs to fight the TB germs. So I, I did that for about four months. Eventually I was clear on TB. But, anyways, uh, I spent the time there being editor of the, the Walt Plain Hospital, uh, TB Hospital editor so I was busy all the time but we had to rest three times a day and but I also had a chance to, to catch up on some of my artwork so anyway I'll show you some of the things I did there okay move on I did come out and then so the, uh, on the basis of coming out before coming out they had a counselor come to see you to prepare you for coming back into the public uh, atmosphere and so uh, they came and say, um, obviously you can't go back into the produce business, weightlifting and all that stuff is too heavy and long hours. He said, we got places where you can find work. I, we have a place here where you can learn to repair watches. And then there's another place you can go in alcohol, you can learn how to make purses and wallets and so forth. And then, being a, a guy that, uh, an artist, I love artwork and so forth, ever since I was a child, I said, you know, I want to go to college and get a degree and teach art. The, t the counselor has hesitated. He said, Tom, I think that's a wonderful idea, but you have to understand, this, the San Diego School District does not hire minorities. Mm. They did not hire minorities. No use going to college to get a degree for art to teach, to be a teacher. Then I said, oh gosh, that, you know, I, I, you know that it occurred to me that I could be an art, I, I could be a teacher. But anyway, I, I just let it go at that, so I came out. So when I came out, I did some bookkeeping for the company, David Produce, but that was boring. One day I saw it in a newspaper about going to uh, Jennings uh, uh, Real Estate College, business college. They didn't care who you were, so I, I went and, and sat in one day, uh, one evening, and it was very interesting. So I decided to take in real estate in a real estate broker. But after I, re I got my real estate broker's license, I also found that they had racial covenants on properties. 85% mm -hmm. of your properties in San Diego, except in the so-called ghetto area, mm -hmm. yeah. did not have it. The, the restrictions are that minorities cannot own the property. Mm -hmm. However, they can be on the property as servants and mm -hmm. household workers and things of that sort. So, you know, anyways, I did get my license and that's, I opened my office in Southeast San Diego, where minorities are and so forth. And that, that, that magazine I write at the Border Realtor. I made an application to, uh, to, uh, to be a member of the of Border Realtor, and they never acted upon it. So this year it goes years, of being, this came out many years later, this, this magazine. Uh, after I became very successful in real estate and went on to the city council 
and went on to the state legislature. And I went back into real estate after all that. And they asked me to come in and form a governmental committee and so forth. And the governmental committee became so effective in getting real estate laws passed and everything for the state of California. They named me Man of the Year on the Board of Realtor. The, the, the organization that could not take me in because I was a minority. So years later, I became Man of the Year. So anyways, uh, that's my uh, first wife, Dorothy from Hawaii. That's my first child. That's my uh, first real estate office. And uh, to be a little fancy, we bought a little car called MG <laughs> from England. So anyways, uh, uh, the, uh, the business kicked off real well. But uh, let me tell you, there are a lot of people that just didn't understand the, the uh, segregation of our society at that time. And uh, many of the Caucasian people I, who were in the real estate business, I got to know. They had uh, people in the minority areas, which are mixed people, there are whites there too, would list their property. But they, they don't, won't want to or need to work in the minority area. So they would always call me, say, Mom, I got this listing, I want to turn it over to you. So before, you know, I had, a, I had all these people running around giving me these listings. So I did real well on that too. So, you know, they, they were good friends, but that was the way it was. And so anyway, let's move on that. So we, 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 we went into development business. Uh, we, one time we uh, owned up to 1,500 apartments here in Southern California, Phoenix, uh, uh, Tucson, and uh, in the Las Vegas, Memphis, and so forth. And these are some of the work, and these are some of the ones that were in magazines and so forth with some of our, our, our places here. Okay, let's move on. So real estate has been good for us, but we remain in a produce market. It became a rather large market, but let me just share with you something about our produce business. We became a good medium-sized produce company. And my dad had many friends in a produce company, but he passed away. While my brothers were working at the produce company, one day, man called Art Glor, Mr. Art Glor, had the largest produce firm in San Diego, just directly across the street from David Produce Company. He called my brother Jim up. Jim is this brother on the right of my, my uh, right side of me. And that's my brother Jim, he's the oldest brother. He's the so-called, quote, father of the house. And, uh, because we didn't have a father. He, he became the leader. And he called Jim, Mr. Glor. He, he, when Jim came, he wasn't sure what Mr. Glor, the biggest produce house in San Diego, wanted of him. And he said, Jim, would you like to take over Grower's Company, Grower's Marketing Company? My first answer, Jim's first answer was, Mr. Glor, we don't have that kind of money. He said, Jim, who said anything about money? He said, well, what do you mean? Then he went in the store, he said, Jim, I want to tell you this. Your father was my best friend when he died. That was many years ago. And I have seen your boys from a small company after your dad died, build it up to a good company. And you'll work around the clock and I'm going to turn the country, uh, uh, company over to you and your brothers. Mm -hmm. Then he said, but, but how can I pay you for the money in your company? He had about 50 employees and so forth. And uh, he had half a block downtown there. And uh, he said, you don't have to pay, but I have three conditions. One is that you rent this property. It's a nice building there, and offices and everything, and trucks in there. You rent this building with the appraised value 
we'll get appraised value, you'll pay rent on that. <coughs> American orientated by then. He named James after the fourth president of the United States, James Madison. He named me Thomas after Thomas Edison. Named me after Thomas Edison, the Thomas Edison, the great inventor. And then he named Herbert, second to last over there. He was born in 1932 when Herbert Hoover was elected. His name is Herbert Hoover Hong. <laughs> and then he named George, right there, third on the left. Well, of course, that's the first president of the United States, George Washington. Yeah. And then he named this one, John, his name is John Philip. You know, John Philip who? Susan. Susan. But his name not Susan, John Philip Holland, that's his name. That's the kind of name he gave us. And then I'll tell you, then there's this one, third on the right. That's my youngest brother. That's the one who used to pick the watermelon, smallest one, first. He became, his name is Paul. Guess who? Paul, you know that guy in New England against the British, shouting, the British are coming, British are coming, after Paul Revere. He said, Paul Howe. And you know, of all the kids, he's probably the smartest. Yeah, when he was 16, he got a scholarship to Stanford and Berkeley, and there's where he got his degree. He became an attorney, and so after two years, no, when he became an attorney, uh, he decided to do something for for the poor, and uh, and so they sent him to uh, to Texas in San Antonio in the ghetto area, helping the poor in, in, in law work and so forth. So one couple of years when he was home for Christmas, which he comes home periodically, he said, you know, uh, I. I, I, I just feel that I'm not doing the best thing I can do. Uh, you know, they don't need law. They need, they need health issues. They say, I'm thinking about going back to school to get a, a doctor's degree. So he went to Davis, Cal Davis, and got his degree in, in, as a medical man. Mm -hmm. He made a big mark in Sacramento as a medical man doing things. They named a big clinic, big huge clinic after him. Uh, but, but anyway, that's, that's how, how my dad brought us up, you know, that's how we, he felt how we can fit in. Okay, let's move on. When I decided to run for public office, uh, I wanted to run public office to say before this, uh, this is my swearing in here, I, I was maybe about uh, 29, 28, or so forth. Uh, I was helping uh, some of the Democrat uh, candidates, and I knew a lot of Democrat friends. They were in the produce business, and in and, and the areas that we lived, there was a, a Democrat district, so I, I would pass out pamphlets and so forth. and. Uh, when one day I mentioned this to the chairman of the Democrat Party when he was down there. I said, sir, you know, I would like to run for public office one day. He looked at me in the eyes, put his hands on my shoulder and said, Tom, I think that's a great idea. A minority has never been elected in the history of San Diego. I can prepare you. In 10 years, we'll get you ready. You know, for a young man, 10 years is a long time. <laughs> so I just kind of put it on my mind. So a couple of years later, when I was at a conference meeting, I, I was sitting with a retired commander of the U.S. Navy. We talked about a lot of things, just family and things. And then I just happened to mention I would like to go into public office one day. 
And I told him about what was told me. Then he said, Tom, he stopped right there. I want you to be a man. And don't tell me, don't ask me who he is. You meet me on the 11th floor of the home federal building on Broadway. And tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So I met him there the next day at 10 o'clock. There I saw a sign say, Republican headquarters. Then I say, gee, what I'm doing here? <laughs> then as soon as I said that, about to open the, the my friend about to open the door, the door opened. There stood a guy about six foot three, big, well built, well built like a football player. He stuck out his hands, he said, God damn it, you're Tom Hum, aren't you? He said, What's this I hear you should run for public office? I think it's a crock of that he starts citing a lot of other flowery words and so forth. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm used to that kind of talk because in Buddha's business, they talk that way. <laughs> and, uh, and besides, later, I could understand that he is what you call a Mustang in the retired Navy. A Mustang is a guy that joined enlistment man. He didn't go to the U.S. Academy, Naval Academy or anything, that's why he, he's a Mustang. He grew up the ranks during the war. He was a big war hero. He was in the front page of magazine, of Life magazine, Time magazine. He was a big hero. He was a big hero in the aircraft carrier. So um, anyway, so uh, that kind of talk, it was kind of, I, I call that an endearment talk. You know? And so anyway, he said, you come in and I'll talk to you about running for public office. And then he told me, he said, here, put, if you are interested, I'm willing to help you and so forth. Well, indeed he did. He introduced me to different people. He raised funds for me. He told me how to run for a campaign and so forth. I ran, I did win. I became the first minority in the history of San Diego elected to any public office. And so I was elected right there and I got sworn in. So I hit, Les Gary's was his name. Les Gary is a Caucasian guy, and, uh, and my dad was the real mentor to us when we were kids. And the mentor to me in get, get, getting involved in public life was Les Gary's. And so, anyway, my life is done with, it was full of uh, mentors. When I first went to uh, junior high school, 12 years old, I was kind of lost and so forth and the, the first thing the new class went to was an assembly and this is a school where a lot of your immigrant kids went and the or the principal William J. Oaks I remember that name you can remember how, how you don't forget names one of the first thing he said I know a lot of you are from families or folks are from different country and so forth I want you to know this you are Americans now. You can be anything you want. And you, you work hard and you can make it. So for William J. Oates, i never forget that name. And this picture is in there. It will show you up later. It's a fine gentleman. And so when I became assemblyman, I went to the junior high school. And there they had a big display of him, his background. But he passed away many years after. But he was that kind of a guy. You know, he just uh, uh, you know, wanted us to do good. And so, anyway, let's move on here. <clears throat> on, on the city council, uh, they elected me as, well, as vice, vice mayor, and uh, I, I led the charge. I was the principal charge to build a Qualcomm Stadium. That was 50 years ago. So you see the stadium there, and that's the shot the city took. And we went there after it was completed. So, okay, let's move on. And there's a Martin Luther King. One day I got a call during the week, and uh, the minister of the large black church in San Diego called me up and he said, Mr. Hum, 
Martin Luther King is coming to our church this Sunday. And I wonder if you would represent the city and welcome him to the city of San Diego. And he said, it's a great honor for us to have him. And so we appreciate you to do that. I said, I'll be more glad to do it. So I went to that event to welcome Martin Luther King. And they had that Sunday afternoon where the community turned out, many people. And I had the chance to talk to him because before the, 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 the gathering of everybody, just a small handful of the people were able to, be, to have a time to talk to Martin Luther King uh, on a personal basis. So I happened to talk to him there. And then I did say something to him. He said, Mr. Hom, I understand you're doing some good work for the minorities here in San Diego. And then I, well, to be represented as a minority, I suppose that means you're doing good work for minority. Then I said, well, Dr. King, I think you're doing a wonderful work for the minorities. And then he said, and uh, America should be proud of that. Then he said, Mr. Hom, thank you. But you know what I'm doing? I'm doing this for the world. And then I said to myself, he's a bigger man than me. I'm just thinking about locally. He's thinking about <laughs> world. You know. And, but we did chat and, and you know, get to know each other better and so on. I just want to share that incident with you. Okay, let's move on. One Sunday, uh, the Grambling College came to play the Aztecs in San Diego. And the vice mayor, the mayor was out of town, therefore I represented the mayor. And uh, so I met the president of Gremlin College. It's a Negro college where all the well-known uh, Negro people, uh, the icons that have been, I think the, the Marshall, President Marshall on this, Supreme Court was an alumni of that black college. But anyway, um, I met him in the orchestra. Then a few days later, he wrote me, asked me to be commencement speaker at their college in Louisiana. So Louisiana had a lot of, um, let's say, segregation and so forth. And, but anyway, I went down there. First time I was down in the South. And so anyway, I, I was speaker there. And, uh, so we became very good friends. So let's move on on this. When I won the election for city council and I won the second, my second term, I ran again. This is election citywide now. And uh, I won by such a huge majority. As Jeffrey mentioned, I. My opponent only got 7% of the votes in San Diego. I got 93%. No, 83%, I'm sorry. 83. No, 87%. Well, anyway, he got something like 7 or 9%. It, it, it was so lopsided. It, it, was, uh, yeah, it was so lopsided. Ronald Reagan called up the Les Gary's the chairman of the party. He said, what's this I hear about? This guy won such a big majority, he beat, he beat an incumbent. And he said, you know, we can use them up here. I'm one, short, I'm one vote short in getting my program across. And he said, you think you can call this guy home and consider running up here? So he came to talk to me about it. And so I did decide to run after all. So I did run. and beat an incumbent. And so when, when I got there, the, well, he gave me a big educational bill, Reagan. I'm the author of the educational bill, and Reagan signed it. And so uh, he, 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 he gave me special help here and there and so forth. But Reagan, uh, you know, s some of us know Reagan only as a, a movie star. But way before this, Way before this, when I was on the city council, he decided to run for, uh, for governor. So he went all around the state wanting to meet people. 
So I never met Reagan, except they appointed me to be one of the ones to meet with him and chat with him and get opinions about whether he has the work with all to win. But I'll tell you, when before I met him, when I was designated to meet him, I said to myself, gee, a movie star running for a public office like that, how, how, gee, how can he win? But anyway, after meeting him, so we met privately, privately. We met something like 20 minutes, our, our time was 20 minutes to meet with him. After I, he left, got through talking, I said, gee, this guy really has a chance of winning. And you know, indeed he did win. And then so that's how he happened to remember me when, when uh, I was a councilman. You know, there he is signing one of my bills. That was the largest uh, educational bill in the history of the United States pertaining to uh, uh, minorities and uh, second language programs and so forth. Okay, let's move on. When Reagan came in town, and uh, he, he wanted somebody to sit in council office. He chose me to be with him on TV here. So he talked about the issues of California, especially in Southern California. So that's with me and Reagan. So Nixon. 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 I, I, I'm sorry. Nixon. <laughs> 92, what do you expect? <laughs> OK, let's move on. So anyway, when I left government, I was involved in many other things, mostly in business and so forth. And uh, we had property on Fifth Avenue. And one day a group came to see me and said, Tom, you know, this used to be the center of town, Fifth Avenue. And here we have these gold rule places, street walkers, and these uh, uh, at all stores and so forth. He said, what can we do about it? You know, it is changing so much, we're losing our business and so forth. And some of our well-established companies that's been there for 50 years and so forth. And so anyway, they asked, they asked me, what can they do about it? Then it occurred to me that when I was on the city council, I was one of those that made the movement through my wife, Dorothy. She was a historian. And uh, Say Old Town, Old Town. They had adobe houses and things of that sort. That's where San Diego started. California basically started there. And so, anyway, we formed an organization called Old Town Historical Society. And so we worked with them, and that became the historical San Diego, old San Diego today. So it became a state park, it became so park popular. And there was, I said, you know, there's no reason why we can't do the same thing for San Diego. This is a new area, new San Diego they call, but it's gotten all run down. So that's that's what we did. My wife took charge of a lot of this, and so uh, what she's she's one of these kind of people that can. Uh, she not she she talks uh, very slowly, very caringly, and so forth. And, so we, so, so when I left the city council, they asked me to be president. And so we started the gas lamp quarter. And um, so Dorothy here would go into these adult stores and talk to them about, hey, you have these pictures in the window and so forth. We know you're in business. Why don't you move your picture inside and paint your windows and uh, put a curtain and things like that. So, so, a lot, so a lot of them did that. And so, so eventually, gas lamp became something that uh, was workable and it cleaned up and so forth. And today, gas lamp is one of the uh, focus point of, that's how the uh, convention center was built. And that's how the, the other part, the shopping centers came in and so forth with gas lamp. They said gas lamp was a thing that with the dog that wagged the tail. So, so this today gas lamp property now is one of the highest price, price property in all San Diego. And so, anyway, this is something that my wife uh, had a lot to do with, which I, I helped. So, so, um, so, anyways, uh, let's move on here. 
I remember the after dinner speaker, so I'm going to have to. <laughs> this, this is the Western Meadow building. How we acquired that building, all that property, three square blocks of property. My brother, who ran David Produce, was quite a large company then. It was a very large company. He said, Tom, we have to have more space for parking trucks. We can't leave so many trucks on the street. It's against the law. We get tickets. So we started looking around. And I noticed there were three square blocks of property. This company went out of business, Western Metal Company. They were in business for almost 100 years, but they, after third generation, they just kind of become defunct. They didn't need this kind of business anymore. So we made an effort to buy it. I, I knew the president of Home Federal, uh, Home, Home Federal Savings. They were the one that had the listing on it. And so we made a deal. We bought all that property, three square blocks of property. And so, so we didn't know really what to do with it, but we rented the property. We made as many storage of the place. We made this in a, a retail market area. And people from all over town came. And it ran for about three years and so forth. And then by that time, uh, things were beginning to change in the whole area there. And especially when uh, they pointed me on the committee to find a location to build a baseball park. The baseball park was big. They, they, so, so they were moving out of Qualcomm Stadium. They had to have their own park. And they looked all over town and couldn't find it. And so I was on the committee. And so when they came to downtown, and they said that they figured there's only one place where they can finance such a structure. And I realized that because I knew that there's something what you call increment financing that could finance it. So uh, I, I just stepped off the, the, the board. And then they had other areas to go to, but they looked at this site here. And uh, that's, that's all the property we own. And they say, huh, we found out you're the owner of it. We want to buy it. And I said, look, I'm off the committee now. And uh, uh, you have to do what you have to do. But if, 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 uh, I know that if you want it, you can either condemn it when they have uh, eminent domain. They can condemn it and pay you for what it's worth or they could negotiate the price. Well, you know, we, we brothers have got, we got together and we came up with a solution, gave a fair price for it because uh, we didn't want to go against a city uh, where they have to go through eminent domain, a lot of political issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we say one, there kind of a condition. You keep that big historical building Western Metal. That's historical. So they kept that. And another thing, you name a, something commemorate to the Han family. So they named the plaza, large family, plaza, the Han plaza, the plaza there. And, uh, and so, so anyway, then, also, then voluntarily, they say, Han, I know you come to the heart, big family. So, you know, those on the top there, on top of the Western Meadow, we want to give you all those seats up there, your whole family, that you want to guests and all, that, that reserved for your family for three years. That included, they voluntarily said that, but because we were cooperative with them. So we had that for three years. Gosh, we had so many friends all of a sudden. Anyway. <laughs> So that was the top right up there. So anyways, we did do that, so they got the Western Metal. And my wife is doing this, and that's a signal. And, and this is my second wife, too. And, and, and she's from Hawaii. And you know, when my first wife, the last day before she passed away, she went to hospice. She called my five daughters together and said, girls, I don't want your father to live alone. You find a nice woman for him to marry again. I said, Dorothy, I was 73 then. And she was 80s, 
87. And I said, no, I don't want to marry again. I think I'm fine. I have all these kids. I'm busy. And so, so after she passed away, after she passed away, I decided to visit Hawaii and visit some of the relatives back there. So my two oldest daughters say, Dad, you're going to Hawaii, take us with you. So we, I took them with me. Normally, my late wife and I would attend to a large church, a very large church in Hawaii. But this one, I decided a smaller church, a Chinese church called Judd Street, CCC Judd Street. And that pastor used to be a pastor of our church in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to visit that church. So I decided to visit there instead of that large church. So like all churches on coffee hour, you meet people. And then so, prior to that, three years ago, that pastor who I talked about when he was in San Diego, he retired then. We started what you call East West Christian Outreach Program. That was to start a program to reach work in China, in China. And uh, we knew there were churches in China, that we, we knew there were underground churches, mm -hmm. but we wanted to work in China, East West Christian Outreach. And, and anyways, when I shared that with a person on, in, the, in, the, in the courtyard there, he pointed over there to a lady and said, that woman went on one of those programs. We invited other churches to go with us. We share American gospel music and things of that sort. And, and, and that woman went down there. So I went down to introduce her. So we got to talking. After about 10 minutes, we had to leave. My daughter Gail was with me. Gail went there to her own. We talked, we went back to our hotel in Waikiki. I told her, Gail, I said, Gail, that lady we met, She's pretty nice. You think she'll have dinner with us? So she said, I said, call the church and get her number. <laughs> Gail reached out to her purse and got her phone out and said, Dad, I got her number already. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't share that with her at all, you know, but she detected something. You know, I always thought parenthood had ingenuity over kids. But this, you know, kids have their intuitive that their parents too. So when she reached out to person, I said, God, how'd you get that? I said, Dad, I just got it. You were talking to her. So I said, gee, can you call see whether she would have dinner with us? So you know, I was too embarrassed to call. So she called and she, and she, this good lady is a little brother said, uh, well, my family is coming for dinner. I can't go out, but I appreciate you asking. And Gail brought in the family, typical Chinese woman, I guess. She said, doesn't give up. Tiger mom. Tiger. Said, Loretta, we got to eat out anyways. We're in a hotel. So tomorrow we're eating at Alan Wong's place. And that's a very good hotel. I mean, a restaurant. And uh, we would love to have you join us. So she joined us. So she and my other daughter met with us there and the rest of They talked and talked. And I guess they sh sh sold me to her. <laughs> anyway, when, when I got home, when I got home, I turned on my, my my, my emails, one of the first one I saw was Loretta. <laughs> but before, before that, when, before that I went home, that Tuesday she was head of a homeless program in Hawaii. And they cooked 200 food serving for the homeless in Hawaii. And I said, you know, I can cook, I can help. So I have showed up and helped. In, in, anyways, after we, we, we went, went down, down there serving and so forth, I started eating with the homeless and stuff. She tapped me on the shoulders and whispered to me, would you like to eat in the...
<laughs> so anyway, she stayed at a hotel. Finally, we got to know each other much better. So anyway, I went to Hawaii. We, we got acquainted and so forth. The kids learned to love her and so forth. And is it to the point my six children refer to her when they introduce her to friends at a, to outing and so forth, they don't say, this is my father's wife or my stepmother, so this is my mother. So they come to love her and she loves them. So, uh, so my kids knew what they were doing and I guess she, she's such a fine person. But anyways, uh, this is my first marriage, Dorothy. Yeah, the second on my right there, and my first marriage was on the left. She was 19, and uh, uh, she was, uh, her, her mother was Irish, the father was Chinese, and uh, so, so my children has a little mix too, so, but they're all good kids. And besides that, my first wife was raised by her grandmother. She more Chinese than I was in many ways knew all the traditions of Chinese and so forth. These are my six children. I had one son, that's my son in the center. He passed away three weeks ago. Oh. Too young, way too young. Oh. Nice kid and uh, very entrepreneurial. And uh, these are my five, four daughter, five daughters. Okay, Gail is the uh, third on the right there. And this is part of the family. One day, my brother Alan called me up. Alan is this one right here. He's a re he's a orthodontist and a good businessman. Started a couple of banks, so forth, and uh, he had a lot of assets. Later, I found out he had up to about fifty what you call triple nets. Triple nets are people like. Jack in the Boxes, uh, Burger Kings, and, uh, and, and you know, all, all these kind of big franchises. He had about 50 of them spread all over the country. <coughs> so he's, he's done very well. And uh, he called me up one day, he said, Tom, you know, we, we got to get the family together. The kids are getting older and so forth. He said, I would like to take them on a cruise. So he paid for a cruise on all of these to Alaska. And on the cruise, we were having lunch. And we talked a lot about sports and so forth. He loved sports. And he said, Tom, what's this I hear that your church on, four, on, uh, on near, near Chinatown there? I, I know that the church is overgrown and your folks are are looking for a new church, a bigger church, and you're head of the finance company. I said, yeah, I am. He said, uh, how much are you trying to raise? I said, well, the whole project there costs about $120,000. And he said, oh, what's your biggest contribution so far? I said, 3000 so he went on to talking about sports again. 300,000. 300,000. Oh yeah, yeah, I said, did I say 3,000? Yeah. 300,000, yeah, 300,000, excuse me. So he stepped on talking sports again, so we went back to San Diego, went out of office a few days, I got a letter from him. It was a check, he said, Tom, for the church. It was a three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. Wow! And I called him. I said, "Al, hey, thanks for this check, but why the three hundred fifteen, not three and a quarter and three fifty? <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Tom, when I was writing the first check at three fifty, I thought of buying a good car. I deserve a good car, so I made three fifteen. <laughs> so that's the kind of guy Alan was. A lot of humor and very generous." And he has been very generous too. And so, anyway, this is the family. This is the family. You're gonna see, it's like, almost like a United Nation. And uh, so, so I, I think my dad would be kind of proud of this. And uh, it's, 
I, I, I know most of them by name. You know, I, I, I talked about Yeah, you know, get back to the portraits there. This is William J. Oaks. He's the one that mentored us kids as the, the immigrant kids. And I remember him, he gave me the footing about getting involved for Americans. This is Admiral Les Carriage, the one that stuck his hand out and said, God damn it, I don't care who you are, you tell what it takes to run, you run, and I'll show you. And he did show me, and we did win. So these are my mentors, aside from my father. And throughout my life, there has been mentors and so forth. So the people, big help. But I, 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 I'm not the kind of guy that can um, Accept what a person might come up and say, oh yeah, I own this, I own that, I've done that, I did it myself, nobody helped me, I did it myself. You hear people talk that way. I did it myself, I don't believe that. They have mentors. Your mentor is your father, your mother, your aunt, your uncle, it can be the man next door, a person next door, you know, or people like that. Well, anyways, I might be taking the next speaker's time, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> This is one of my paintings. It's one of my paintings. I, they, uh, I was involved in, continually involved to some degree of the Chinese New Year time and so forth. So I was always impressed with it, the uh, lion dancers. So I painted this. Okay, next. That's it. Well, that's it. <laughs> oh. yeah, I my door. You know, my, my daughter always <laughs> cut me off like that. Dad, I got her number. <laughs> that's, a, that's a wonderful story. <laughs> Thank wonderful you so story. much for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, Tommy, you want to have some water before? Uh, before? Okay. Are you going to take some questions? Oh, yeah, sure. No, the, the, you can sit. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's just wonderful. I think it's uh, too bad the time went oh, yeah, by so sure. fast, and you, you're only getting started, I think. Okay. So, so we, yeah, I, I figured that before we take uh, any questions... Can I just uh, take a seat here? Do you want to sit down, or...? Because yeah. yeah. Tom mentioned a couple of, peop uh, a couple of people, so we wanted to recognize them. First of all, Loretta Tom, uh, Loretta Hong, and uh, Tom Mitchell. <laughs> and I think someday we'll have a, your version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is a smooth talker. And, uh, and the Gail that uh, he also mentioned uh, over here uh, is uh, Lily Chen, Professor Lily Chen here. She's, uh, she's great. She's uh, in charge of uh, translating the book. Chinese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, it, I think, uh, you know, the, the people here, either you're born here or came at a later time, San Diego is a city that we call home. And uh, I, I feel that uh, hearing the story about the history of San Diego is so important to us. And I just feel we're very lucky to have Tom as a, like a, a, a living, witness to the history of the past uh, 100 years and uh, we just feel very happy and I have two wishes also mm -hmm. I wish I could live to 92 at least like you and I wish to be as vibrant healthy as you are that's that's mm -hmm. the most important thing right okay so we're going to take a few few questions uh, and, uh, yes sir Tom, last time I heard you spoke, you talked about how your family helped the Japanese family during World War II. I'd love to hear that story again if you're up to it. In the produce business, there were many Japanese Americans there. And um, 
they had the farms and their wholesale house. My father was a friend of a number of them. And uh, when the war came, naturally, not naturally, but ironically, um, decree in Washington that all the Japanese along the West Coast, and including there, there's, a, there's a group up to Washington all the way down to be taken out of these areas and relocated. And so that's what they did. They had two weeks to pack everything they can carry. Just what they can carry, yeah, it's okay. No more, everything was left. And my dad had a number of Japanese friends, and he, there were a couple very close friends came to see my dad. He said, David, you know, we gotta leave, and we have the farm growing produce. That's in Mission Valley. Always taught us to, the bigger ones, take the heavier lift, lifting, the younger ones participate and so forth. So he'd take the kids down there and the young ones would sort out things and the younger ones would carry the crates and so forth. And uh, so, so we, we farmed that way. But along that line, uh, we have the Chinese community church and there was a Japanese community church as well, same denomination. And uh, uh, there were times that uh, some of the younger Chinese Americans, like myself, and the Japanese American would play basketball, play against each other and so forth. So when they had to leave, and, uh, they, and after some, a few years, they were let off, off the, the relocation camps to come home. And a lot of them were not welcome because of the horror of the war and the Japanese Americans were, were persecuted for, for that, which they had nothing to do with it. And uh, so I started with a group of young people to, um, to have sports event with Japanese Americans and uh, so forth. And some of the parents at the beginning did not agree that was good, but uh, as well as the, the, you know, the uh, other parents as well. But we, we did do it. But, but the thing is this, there was a woman called Margaret Loring, who was a, active with our church, a Caucasian woman. Uh, somehow or another caught hold of somebody in back east and well, they were um, uh, people in, on national radio, no TV then, heard about the story, about the story I was in. And she wrote the story to them. It, it was broadcast over NBC and CBS about Americanism, about how we must come together, you know, American, American kids and all that. And, you know, it was a story about, you know, what we started down here. And then he said that, um, that these, well, it was a good story. And a number of people heard it, heard it. And uh, I think Oliver Cronkite did not talk about the story in length, but he, he acknowledged that story. Walter Cronkite, you're too young to know Walter <laughs> Cronkite. He was the commentator on radio. But anyway, that, that was part of the story of the Japanese, and uh, um, I, I, I support them through our foundation with some of their programs, and uh, I helped them establish the Japanese American Historical Museum as well. And, uh, as a lot of people who were nine Chinese helped start our museum, Chinese Historical Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so anyways, uh, I just want to share that story. If, if you just mentioned Japanese American. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. I have a question. Uh, not, not just a question, but I'd like to uh, have this, take this opportunity to share with the people here about the story that you told me 
Um, this year is a 150 years anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Mm -hmm. Chinese, as all we, we all know, Chinese railroad workers contributed so much. Okay, well, and the story you told me was very, very amazing. So I want to take this opportunity, opportunity to, to share with the rest of us. Well, in the 1860s, the United States, they had the eastern part of the United States and New York and there and so forth. Then the western part, very rural and so forth, but it's beginning to grow. But everything is separate. And then so there's a group of men leaving in Stanford, Stanford University, but they didn't have the university then. Mm -hmm. And Crocker and so forth uh, came together to talk about building an intercontinental railroad from east to west, west to east, and meet together. So they formed this organization to do that. And so the ones in the East had a lot of the immigrant Irishmen, Polish, mm -hmm. working the railroad. They were building the railroad. And here, they were trying to get the people to build a railroad, whoever they can get. They, they, they couldn't get very much done, especially when it comes to Sarah Mountains. They couldn't go over the mountains and so on. Mm -hmm. After it got delayed, they just couldn't figure until Crocker said, you know, I think I know who can build that. The people that built the Great Wall of China can build that. You know. So they hired Chinese. China, they didn't hire Chinese at the beginning, so they hired all the crew of Chinese. And so they crew, they had this crew, and they built that railroad, they built that through the big mountain, built uh, tunnels and everything roads and everything. That was the hardest part of the whole railroad. They built that and they met in, in Utah. And so when they finally met in Utah, the big celebration of the big dignitaries, the financiers, the bankers, and the big business people met. One locomotive facing east, one locomotive facing left, facing each other. And there were over a hundred people, dignitaries there, for this famous photograph. It was famous, historic. It became a famous story in all your history books and so forth. The, the, the irony of it, there was not one photograph of a Chinese person. Mm -hmm. Not one photograph of a Chinese oh, person. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, maybe the Chinese knew it, but nobody else knew about it. Mm -hmm. So when I got elected to the State Assembly, I was in caucus. Caucus is when the party came together. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party came together, we met with the governor and so forth. So I mentioned to the governor. I said, Governor, <laughs> you know, the big photograph we have at the Capitol here shows the railroad coming together in 1865. And we, everybody knows the Chinese were involved in building from the east, from the west towards the east. But there's no Chinese in it. Is, is that right? I didn't know that. You know, I, 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 people didn't, didn't think about it. And so the next day, he contacted Historical Railroad Museum. And they happened to have that photograph in there but also a painting of that photograph, but that painting of the photograph, they have painted Chinese faces in there. Aww. So they sent that painting to the governor mm -hmm. to show what a true picture of what the Chinese involvement of the railroad. Mm -hmm. So I just want to tell you, um, you know, it wasn't something I planned, but something came up to me that I, I, I caught the governor's ear and uh, so, so, that, so that was done. So that painting is somewhere. So that was 50 years ago. But anyway, we all know the Chinese have to be Thank you. Thank you.
and uh, I'm also a student of UCSD. So uh, it's really my honor today to meet you, like such a great Mr. Senegal. So uh, my question is, how do you think about Chinese or widely Asian uh, people participate in uh, U.S. like politics? Or do you have any like suggestions, or do you encourage like us, uh, younger generation, like college students, to get involved to social justice field? I encourage that a great deal. I've been in talking to different areas and so forth of LA and to different cities and so forth, Arizona as well. Um, you know, every community is different and so forth, but uh, you start from the grassroots, you know, and uh, you get people to know you, and uh, you you map out the district that you want to run in, and uh, you 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 can find you can almost decide where some of your strong support can come from and where some of the other is swingable. And then you know some areas that, hey, better write off, you know. So you do make that concentration. And, but sometimes, um, uh, it's, you, you run against an incumbent, and so you gotta know your incumbent, where the weaknesses are, and their strengths are, and so forth. So you work that way. But above all, get involved. Get involved from the grassroots level. Now, when, when I was on the city council, there was, I did not know any minority sat on the, 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 the um, rezoning board, the history board, and these different boards. Every city has these boards with people they ask to be part of citizen involvement. Did not have one that I can remember. And so I had to tell the different people in the community, but but they don't know how to do about it. So what I did, talk to the uh, different committee chair, say reach out to these different areas. And they have, they have, and they got the board. You know, they're not paid, most of them are not paid, but they're community involvement, you know. And uh, so, so a number got involved. So uh, since then, since I got elected, there's been a minority on the board that's over 50 years since. So anyway, you know, you don't go just to break the barrier, you go there to serve. You go through that dedication, it's okay. So you can make it. Yeah, I, I have one comment regarding this aspect. See, most of Chinese uh, uh, people here encourage kids to go to be a medical doctor, Okay, computer science. One of the very important possibility is to encourage kids to be in political science or lawyer. Okay, so this is the way to get into the legislation. You see, we need a we need a voice in the society. So see, that, making money. It's not that important. <laughs> really, we need a voice. If we don't talk, we do not get what, not that we want is good or bad, but anyway, for our community, that's very, very important. So on that note, I wanted to make a comment also. There, there, there are people uh, of color running office, mm -hmm. ne never enough, right? We do have a role model like a Tom. Oh yeah, definitely. We definitely have a definitely. role model like Tom, but yes. there is another person in the audience who has also run the office. And uh, my another friend, Denise Kisson, <laughs> sitting in the back, and she ran as a candidate for the 52nd District Congress <laughs> two years ago. She's also getting guidance help from uh, from Tom. Yeah, we, we met Tom at uh, one of the gatherings for, for Denise. 
his, he was getting involved, and like I said, he's provided the guidance, leadership, very generous. So it's wonderful. It's, it is wonderful. Yeah, just get involved. Different areas, grassroots level, candidate, and so forth. You know? yeah. I, I learned a lot when I was candidate. When I was running for election. Yeah, you, know, you meet a lot of interesting people. I knock on doors and so forth. Matter of fact, I did knock on one door. A big gentleman, a Caucasian gentleman, well built, gray hair, stuck out of his hand. He said, Good to see you walk, young man. It's good for you. Walking is good for you. He said, It keeps your balance. He said, You should keep yourself balanced because when you get older, you, like, you, you have the, the chance of falling, get injured. He was 90 something, just tell me. <laughs> and so, so I remember him all that time. So every morning I do Tai Chi for 45 minutes. <laughs> so, so I don't fall. But I might slow down, but I don't fall. <laughs> okay. I want to add that um, this group, especially if you speak um, Chinese, they need uh, people to take the census, to be census takers. So if you have any time that you could spare, see David said, uh, he's a member of our church, and um, he is helping to look for bilingual uh, people to, you know, and that's one way of getting involved. Uh, Loretta, before she married me, she was very active in the uh, political area in Hawaii. She's a Democrat. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 it's, so it's okay, you know. We have different opinions. My kids, six kids, they all have different opinions. But they're good people. As long as they're good people. We, we take one last question. Uh, because uh, we, we needed to get out of here in uh, like 20, 20 minutes or so, and we still want to save some time for people to come talk to uh, Tom in, uh, afterwards and also get a chance to get the books and after. So we'll take one more. Ying, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for sharing your story with us. I think it's important for us to apply the historic wisdom to the current uh, society. So my question is, today America is very divided. And as a Asian American or Chinese American politician, who do we align with? Do we align with the minorities or align with the majorities? I feel like that's one struggle that some of my friends are having. Because in the past, we saw like how the Chinese American, because we, are, we were alienated and we were, uh, so we aligned a lot with the minorities. But today, I feel a lot of Chinese, um, they feel like they, they felt like they, th their interests may be more aligned with the majority. So, so can you share some of your wisdom with us? Like, how do we survive or do thrive in such a divided um, society today? Yes, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, I remember my father saying, playing in the city hall there, remember, laws that come out of there is the kind of people they put in there. Mm -hmm. And so, I, 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 I'm very sensitive to some of the uh, minority issue, and uh, sometimes we need to talk about the bigger picture, the bigger picture for the good of the, the whole city or country, or whatever the case is. So, um, my dad was one of those, that's the reason he named us the names we got, that was the bigger picture. And so, so we, we have uh, uh, both of these areas. I, I remember in 1957 when we finally saved enough money, uh, we, my brothers and I, saved enough money to buy a bigger house for all the kids. And for my mother wanted the kids to be in a better school district, a bigger house. So we found a house just a block away from Belbo Park. And it's a nice area. But that one particular house, a three-story house, three-story, and it was a vacant. Weeds were growing around it, and uh, paints were peeling, and so forth. And the broker, who was a Caucasian gentleman, they say, huh, there's a house there. 
he, he, he was having trouble placing us in a good area. You know, you know it, it was turned down. Then he said, because this house is so need help, uh, maybe we, we can do something with it. Mm -hmm. So my mother saw it from the outside. And uh, so she took my little brother Paul, about two, three years old, went door to door, four blocks around introducing herself and say, I am so-and-so, and she's a widow, you know, I'm so-and-so, I have children, they're all good children, and so far, I would like to buy that house, so-and-so, and we fix it up, and we will be good neighbors. Well, she must have knocked on about 40 or 50 store, doors around these blocks. She did not get one <coughs> refusal, although there's a grant deed that says that somebody has to challenge it, take it to court, you know. But nobody did. We lived there for 35 years. And so sometimes you need to do these things and uh, go against the grain. Mm -hmm. And if you're, you're, your task is noble, do it, you know. And so, so there are times that you need to look at the bigger picture, and some other times you need to look at the pictures that's close to you that you better, you can understand better than your colleagues who are not of that background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say what a privilege to come here, Jeff and Tracy and all my friends out there and my new friends. So I just want to say it's a wonderful opportunity to share with you. Uh, last year we were in China with uh, Lily, and my Chinese book is in over 6,000 classrooms now in Chinese. And, uh, and so it's in about 30 or 50 countries as well. So I just want to show appreciation to Lily for doing this. And when I was in China, gave a lecture there, there was so much interest in people about Chinese Americans, about America, and so forth. And as you could see they want to be friends with America. So I think we are the link to be the friend to make this span here. So I just want to share that with you. Thank you.